Thank you all for standing by and welcome to our webinar, Milwaukee's Climate Initiative. These webinars are an initiative of the Ohio State University Climate Change Outreach Team, a multi-departmental effort within the university led by Ohio Sea Grant, Ohio State University Extension, the Great Lakes Regional Water Program, Bird Polar Research Center, and six other OSU departments to help localize the climate change issue for Ohioans and residents of the Great Lakes region. I am Ann Baird from the School of Environment and Natural Resources at The Ohio State University. Joining me today is Kevin Schaefer from the Milwaukee Metropolitan Sewerage District. Kevin has been the Executive Directory, Director of the District since 2002 and oversees the Regional Sewer Utility for the 1.1 million people who live in the Milwaukee, Wisconsin region. Prior to joining the district, Kevin spent 10 years in private industry with an international engineering firm in Chicago and Milwaukee, and six years with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers in Fort Worth, Texas. We're delighted to have Kevin here today to discuss this exciting work. But before we do that, a few logistical issues as we get started. During our presentation, all participants will be in listen-only mode. Around 1240, I will conduct a question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question during the presentation, please feel free to do so at any time using the chat feature located on the right-hand side of your screen. I will collect and organize the questions and pose them at the end of the presentation. We have over 100 participants registered, are actually on the call now, now with many registered. It is a great diverse group representing governmental agencies, academia, and nonprofit groups from the Great Lakes and around the country. Please keep your questions coming throughout the presentation, and we should have a great Q&A session at the end. As a reminder, this webinar is being recorded and will be posted onto our website for later viewing. We will also post a webinar survey in the chat feature toward the end of the hour. Please take a few minutes after the webinar to fill out the survey. It will help us continue to bring you better webinars. Without further delay, I'd like to introduce Kevin Schaefer. Kevin? Hi, Ann. Uh, thank you, everyone, for having me on here, and good morning or good afternoon. I hope everyone can hear me okay. Um, I would like to start by thanking the Ohio State University, all the different departments, for uh, asking me to uh, speak. It is uh, it's quite an honor to be able to uh, present some of the uh, initiatives that we have ongoing here in Milwaukee. And I think it's important to state up front that a lot of what we're, we're about to, what I'm about to show you and what we've been implementing have a number of reasons for why we started implementing it. I can't tell you that climate change was the, the driving factor on all of these uh, approaches. But um, when you bring them together and you start looking at them as a group, they all have um, uh, very beneficial uh, results for the climate and, and helps us be more prepared for what I feel is the, a changing climate. All of it uh, is really tied together in a document that is our sustainability plan. You'll see that cover on the lower right side of this cover slide. Um, MMSD.com is our website and you, you'll see a sustainability button on the left. So you'll be able to uh, pull up this document if you, you, so, uh, if you so choose. Just a little background on the Milwaukee Metropolitan Sewage District. We are a regional uh, sewer uh, district. We uh, have 28 different satellite municipalities, 1.1 million people, and we cover an area of about 411 square miles. We provide both wastewater conveyance storage reclamation as well as managed flooding. So we have a really a multifaceted uh, jurisdictional uh, charge that we pursue. We have over 300 miles of sewers. Uh, the municipalities and our, our individual uh, customers add another 6,000 miles to that. And really the, the first piece of what we put in place, or one of the first pieces, was a 521 million gallon tunnel system uh, along with the two uh, water reclamation facilities. So you'll hear me talk a lot today about green infrastructure and some of these um, newer approaches but it all boils down back to the backbone, which is the, the sewer system, the water reclamation facilities, and the deep tunnel system. And as we have learned over the last 10 to 15 years, 
while I may have a, a sewer service area, which is shown on this map as the kind of red box, um, water doesn't stop at a political boundary. It doesn't stop um, at a municipal uh, uh, city limit. It, it has its own boundaries on the watershed. And so when we look at these initiatives from a water standpoint, from a climate change standpoint, we need to look at them regionally. We need to look at them from a watershed basis and really work with all of those partners that we, um, what we, that we uh, discover and learn uh, about as we move forward. I talked about having two water reclamation facilities. Um, I should have said at the beginning that Milwaukee is on the western bank of Lake Michigan, so we uh, are a direct uh, uh, city directly on the uh, banks of the Great Lakes. Our two uh, water reclamation facilities discharge directly into Lake Michigan. The one on the left is the Jones Island water reclamation facility. On a dry day, this uh, facility will treat about 75 million gallons a day. On a wet day, that can go up to 330 million gallons a day. South Shore um, Water uh, Reclamation Facility is about the same. It treats 75 MGD on a dry day and 300 on a, on a rainy day. So we have a very uh, robust capacity to treat wastewater and stormwater as it moves through the systems. And since 1926, we've been producing a product called melorganite. When you treat wastewater, one of the, the byproducts of that treatment process is a biosolid. A lot of places will incinerate this or land apply it. We've been producing this uh, commercial fertilizer, uh, melorganite, since 1926, and we sell about $7.5 million a year of this product. So here's really the, the foundation for the sustainability efforts of the Milwaukee region. In 1926, we took a product that would have at that time just been thrown out on a field or burned or discarded in some fashion, and we uh, provided a beneficial reuse for that. We sell it throughout the United States and Canada, and it's uh, really taking a, a byproduct of our process and creating something that's going to enrich the soils, increase the biology, the, uh, improve the biology of those soils and help us to grow food in the future. In the deep tunnel that I talked about, um, the original tunnel uh, went online in 1993. Actually, in another month, it'll be 20 years old. Uh, the tunnels are about 300 feet below ground, 521 million gallons of storage, 28 and a half miles long, and 17 to 32 feet in diameter. So it's... Um, uh, it was the first piece that we put in place to really tr uh, address some of the issues that came out of the 1972 Clean Water Act. And it was designed to still have a few CSOs. It was designed to have 1.2 CSOs per year. Right now we're just under 2.5 combined sewer overflows a year. So where we had 50 to 60 overflows before, we've dropped that down to um, around 2.5 which is an extremely good record for combined sewage uh, systems. And if you want to look at that in a different fashion, so August 1993, the tunnel came online. The first full year of operation was uh, 1994. And you can see the record every year uh, since the tunnel's been in place. Uh, we've always, on an annual basis, captured and treated um, at least 94% uh, of the water that came to us. So uh, in 1999, it was the low year, 94%. That 6% that was not captured and treated was overflows. So if you take all the years together, we've captured and treated 98.2% of everything that's come to our system. Um, the federal government likes combined sewer systems to treat 85%, and um, we're exceeding that. We're, we're doing much, much better. So the deep tunnel, although wasn't meant to... Uh, address climate change issues, what we're finding is that it's helping us to clean our, our water environment, preserve the, uh, the drinking water supply that we have, the triple bottom line that we talked about, that's the environmental and, and uh, social sides of this, uh, really allowing us to protect the drinking water, protect the Great Lakes, protect that recreational asset that we have, an economic asset, and uh, it's, it's been just a great uh, piece of infrastructure. But 
it may all sound rosy in Milwaukee. It really has been. Um, we, we have had some really tough times. These pictures you see are from the 2008, 2009, 2010 time frame. And if you look at that lower picture, yes, that is an SUV sitting in the bottom of a sinkhole um, that was uh, due to a storm. The bottom right picture is the Knickknick River uh, exceeding its banks and flooding. And then if you've ever been to Milwaukee in the summer, um, we have something called Summerfest, which are the festivals. And it's hard to have a festival when the festival grounds are underwater, which is that top picture. So we have these extreme events that, in my line of work, we have to be able to at least plan for and understand better because when it comes down to the aftermath of these storms, people are looking for a solution. They're looking for a way to improve their lives and, and how can they do that by um, working with their government agencies. We try to look at these from long-term planning sustainability standpoints and address these issues. And actually, right now, we have a, a plan on the street uh, asking for proposals for, uh, it's called a climate change vulnerability analysis. What we're looking for is what do we need to do uh, with our future planning to really address um, climate change and, and where are we vulnerable uh, so that we can uh, reinforce those, those locations. And what we're using is we had the, uh, the state uh, Wisconsin Initiative for Climate Change Impacts uh, out of the University of Wisconsin, they developed uh, kind of the statewide uh, predictions of climate for, uh, for the state of Wisconsin. And while this was great for the state, we wanted to really bring this down to the regional level, southeast Wisconsin. So what we did was we worked with our regional planning commission, southeast Wisconsin Regional Planning Commission, Sewer PAC, and the university to take the national data and the state data and really drill it down to a regional, local uh, level. And what we found is we're going to have more intense, heavy, long-duration rainfalls. Uh, we may have less rainfall on an annual basis, but that rainfall is going to occur in shorter periods of time, more intense rainfall events, which when you manage a combined and separate sewer system, regional system, uh, those are the... the the uh, storms that you really have to try to plan for. So that's why we're looking at some of these, uh, this vulnerability analysis that we're moving forward with. We've taken the data, we've moved it down, we see where we need to go. And in 2011, we approved a vision for the year 2035. So we had the tunnel in place, we had the water reclamation facilities in place, we had all this great gray infrastructure that was doing a really good job on meeting uh, you know, regulations from the federal and state uh, regulators, but we felt and we still feel that we need to do more. So we developed this vision. It's on our website. You see the site there. And it's really got two major uh, goal areas. One is integrated watershed management, and then one is energy efficiency, climate mitigation, and ad adaptation. I'm going to focus a lot on the right side of this slide, but just Thumbing through the left side, the big pieces of this are zero overflows, both combined and separate, and zero homes in the 100-year floodplain. A lot of other things listed there, but we are looking to really take our system to the next level and, and really be much better than what the uh, state and federal governments are requiring. On the right side, uh, we're addressing climate change and climate adaptation through energy efficiency. Um, what we're trying to do is... Um, say how can we be more efficient with the energy that we use and then can we also uh, turn our sources from carbon-based uh, uh, sources to, to a, a renewable energy source. So we've set a goal for 100% of our energy needs to be renewable energy with 80% of that coming from uh, internal renewable sources. And so that means that MMSD would produce its own energy. I think that's one revelation that we've come to through this whole process. We have two very good wastewater plants that do a great job of cleaning water, but that same infrastructure can be tweaked, and we also feel that we can produce a lot of energy from the biosolids that come to the system, from 
uh, the rooftops and, and, and the wind that we get off of the, uh, the lake. So we're really looking at all the different sources of renewable energy to try to address our energy efficiency issues and, and, and renewable energy sources and try to uh, reduce our impact on the environment. We set a goal for the carbon footprint to be reduced by 90 percent. We did a study in 2005 that established the baseline for our carbon footprint, so that's the baseline that we'll reduce uh, by 90 percent from. And then we have a green seams project program that I'll talk about in a minute where we're purchasing buffers that we're hoping to sequester about 30 percent of uh, our carbon footprint with that initiative as well. So this vision was approved by my commission in 2011. I wasn't sure how the community would respond to it, but it's really been a, a, a great uh, document that allows us to focus our discussions a little bit better. And internally for staff, it's been one of those things that we can really refer back to, and it really has um, in, incentivized and energized my staff to think outside the box and to do really some great creative things that um, I'll be talking about. One of the first things we realized also was that we need to focus everything on watersheds. We need to look at the water that's coming down from upstream and, and the water that we put downstream. So we partnered with Sewer Pack again. They developed a, uh, a regional uh, water quality plan for all of the watersheds. It's 1,127 square miles, nine counties, 83 municipalities, a huge planning and engineering effort, but even a larger public input effort because we were stepping outside of our comfort zone, the uh, sewer service area, and talking to all uh, water producers upstream and downstream and looking at all different land types as well. The result of that study came back and it said, um, you know, you've done a lot for improving water quality. This graphic is just a snapshot. It's looking at fecal coliform loadings to the greater Milwaukee watersheds. And in 1975, right after the Clean Water Act passed, about 49% of the fecal coliform load coming to the rivers was, was from combined sewer overflows. Uh, separate sewer overflows, 2%. Wastewater treatment plants, 5% urban, non-agricultural, urban stormwater was about 23%, and rural stormwater about 21%. So that was the picture in 1975. That's what prompted us to build the deep tunnel system and upgrade our plants. Over that next uh, 25 years, through that work and about $3 billion of investment, we were able to reduce our uh, pico coliform loadings onto the rivers by about half and um, we put all of our money into CSOs, SSOs, and wastewater treatment plants, and what we found was that the pie got smaller, but the, uh, the pieces of the pie that we were not addressing, stormwater, both urban and ag, became uh, larger contributors to the overall load. So when this study came out in the uh, early 2000s, this science told us we need to look at water management not just differently, but in a, in a larger context. We need to step back and say, how do we address stormwater? How do we address wastewater? How do we look at all the different issues that are facing our water environment? So we, we continued with a very heavy gray infrastructure initiative. We're doing a lot with um, improving the conveyance to the, uh, the, uh, the treatment facilities. Uh, this is the Harbor Siphons Project where we built new siphons carrying water under the harbor to the Jones Island facility, helping us to minimize overflows, but it also helps us to minimize flows to the deep tunnel. And one of the, uh, the detriments of the deep tunnel is once the water enters that tunnel, it drops 300 feet, and we have to use energy to pump it back up to the plants so that we can treat that. So the more water that we can convey to the plants keeping it out of the tunnel, preventing us from having to run the pumps as often, is reducing our carbon footprint as well, making the system more efficient, and helping us to really manage um, both the energy, the water, uh, the economic uh, impacts of that pumping, and the environmental impacts in a more uh, holistic fashion. 
I also talk about flood management work that we do. Um, I'm a civil engineer by background, and in the 1960s, my profession thought that the best way to manage floodwaters was to build a concrete liner and just shove that water downstream as fast as possible so you'd reduce flooding. Unfortunately, that um, re uh, increases the uh, risk for flooding downstream. It reduces the water infiltration. It, it basically negates any habitat in the uh, region, in the watershed, I should say. And now we're, you know, 40 or so years later, and those concrete linings are failing. So we decided instead of replacing those with concrete, we were going to go with a more natural solution. Kniknik River is one of them. This is the lower stretch. The upstream left picture and the bottom right picture are the after shots. These were taken about a year ago, and it's, it's really uh, quite beautiful today. We're moving upstream from this location. We're going to be removing more um, more concrete as we go upstream. And then county grounds, another very large $90 million uh, plus or minus flood management project. But again, we're not just building a deep, ugly hole that we're going to pour water into and store it. We're making it a, a, a recreational asset. We're creating habitat. We're creating infiltration into the groundwater. We're trying to mimic nature as much as possible so that we can really try to work with nature to reduce our impacts on the climate, improve the climate, and soften our, this plus the concrete removal, trying to soften our uh, land cover so that we reduce the heat island impacts of, of uh, urban uh, centers. We try to reduce the uh, human impact on the climate. Hard Park, just another flood management project. Again, removed concrete, naturalized an area, removed uh, homes from this area, created a park, created an open space for recreation, trying to blend in together uh, everything that we're doing. And these are all large-scale projects. These are in the millions of dollars that we're talking about. And these are things that the district was doing really prior to us thinking about climate change, but they all build back into that bigger picture that these are, these are approaches that we need to work on collectively. Green Seams, this is probably one of the signature projects where we are out as a sewer district. We are purchasing property in low areas, wetlands, uh, floodplains. We have over 25 acres, 2,500 acres purchased right now. We're putting a conservation easement on that land, turning it back over to municipalities. They're using it for recreational purposes, trails, and so forth. And it allows us to reduce nonpoint pollution to the rivers, allows us to reduce flooding downstream because this land is not going to be covered with concrete. And it really uh, allows us to soften that urban network that I talked about before to really allow um, uh, us to uh, uh, be more like nature as we move forward to uh, uh, implement uh, changes for the, the climate. So those are all large-scale projects. Those are things that we're doing, you know, with millions of dollars at regional uh, areas. But we also understand that for us to really have an impact, we need to drill this down to the individual, to the ratepayers, to the um, the homeowners and businesses. So we've initiated a green infrastructure program uh, here. Karen Sands is my manager of sustainability. She's implementing this along with uh, my uh, sustainability office. Uh, Tim Bates part of that as well. And what we're doing is trying to educate about the benefits of these smaller, uh, more lot-sized approaches. We have a rain gardens initiative, the Lake Michigan Rain Gardens Initiative. We've sold over 18,000 plants. We get these from a foundation for half price, and we um, sell them to our constituents for half price. And then what you see in the upper right is a, a rain garden day where we teach people how to build a rain garden, where to build a rain garden. Don't place them over the top of your laterals from your house, uh, your sanitary flows from your house, and, and really show them that they can be an, an aesthetic benefit as well for the region. Rain barrels, this was the first uh, program that we started for uh, green infrastructure. Everyone has a downspout off of their house. Now, I know in some parts of the country you can't capture rainfall and, and reuse it, but in Wisconsin you can. 
So we started a rain barrel program. We sold 18,000 of them since 2002. Every time we get a good rainstorm, we sell quite a few. These have been painted by a local um, uh, children's uh, education, art, art inter education program. So it really brings the community together. It shows them how they can manage the water that comes off their roofs better. And it also um, teaches them how to manage water. So it, a lot of people will say rain barrels don't have a big impact on your stormwater uh, runoff or on your uh, overflows. But they really do, if you think about it, from the public education, from the public participation, from the involvement that we all need from our constituents. So I, I really, and this basically is a low cost, very low cost. We charge $50 for the rain barrels. It really is a low cost way to get your public more involved and get the media involved. And the media are, is very important to make sure that they help you distribute the messages uh, throughout to everyone. Next is uh, Green Roofs. This is the uh, Rockwell Automation uh, Facility in Milwaukee. We have over 10 acres of green roofs uh, in the uh, uh, area. This, uh, the reason we do green roofs is it allows us to uh, infiltrate water into the green roof, prevent it from running off into the, uh, the, the, uh, the drains that you see in the picture and into the uh, area storm sewer and sanitary sewers, the combined sewer system. So there's a direct benefit from green roofs. This one on Rockwell has a website where you can go and you can see the, the water that's uh, rained on the roof, how much of that's been captured. But they also talk about the air conditioning costs because this extra layer of insulation on the roof reduces their air conditioning costs. So it saves them operation and maintenance dollars in the long term because of that. We've talked about projects, but some of this gets down to how do we govern, how do we regulate, how do we think about uh, climate change issues or water issues. In one of our watersheds, we went to the EPA, um, Susan Hedman's in the lower left picture being uh, interviewed, the Region 5 administrator, and we said, you know, there's, there's got to be a wetter, better way to manage these flows than to just allow them, to, uh, each community have its own permit. So working with the Department of Natural Resources, which has been a great partner, the uh, sewer pack again, and uh, EPA, we were able to bring the communities together, develop a framework for a watershed permit, which occurred last August, and the communities liked the framework so well, they took that to their common councils last fall, and all of them accepted it, and in uh, December of last year, the DNR issued the first watershed permit for the state and one of the few in the country. So when you think about climate change, you have to think about partnerships, you have to think about leadership, but you have to think about how do we uh, change or manipulate uh, the structure of how we think about these issues so that we can also um, regulate in a more efficient fashion. Getting more to the energy side of what we're doing, um, in 2008, we initiated the landfill gas project, which is taking, uh, it will take uh, methane gas that's produced at a landfill, dewater that gas, clean that gas, pump it through a 19-mile pipeline down to Jones Island uh, facility. We have a new turbine building, which I'll show a picture of, and um, three turbines that are going to burn that landfill gas, produce electricity, and and really power the plant during dry weather. And only when we're running the deep tunnel pumps will we have to purchase elec additional electricity for the uh, facility. So we're reducing our carbon footprint, we're reducing the cost of operation, we're purchasing the landfill gas for 48 cents on the dollar for uh, natural gas. And um, it's really hitting that triple bottom line uh, effort and reducing our, our impact on the environment. This is a picture of the turbine building. Uh, upper left is the building itself, and then we've got the compressors and the turbines all within that building. We have three of these right now. Uh, we will be operational with this entire uh, facility uh, by the end of July this year. So uh, come August, we'll have uh, seen a huge improvement in our uh, reduction in our carbon footprint. We'll also see um, a huge reduction in our costs. 
And this really shows the uh, the, the uh, reduction that we're looking for. If you looked at all sources, we're somewhere in the 72,800 metric tons of equivalent CO2 today. Uh, we reduced that because of the landfill gas project. We reduced that down to uh, 36, 3,600. So it's about a 95% reduction in our um, CO2 equivalent uh, emissions, just a huge reduction. And so when we talk about landfill gas, we always talk about the um, uh, the benefits to the, the taxpayer, but there's also this huge benefit to the environment and, and helping us to adapt and be more prepared for the future. We also have solar panels that were installed at Jones Island. We put those on approximately uh, eight to eight or eight or so years ago. It's 20 kilowatts. You know, on the big scheme of things, with what we uh, use at Jones Island, it's a very small contributor. But you really have to look at some of these smaller signature projects. Just this picture alone sends a huge message to constituents and others about trying to address these issues in a holistic fashion. And you can go to our website under that same sustainability uh, button. You can go and you can track the actual uh, energy on a daily basis, actually instantaneous basis, being produced by this solar panel. And a project that's uh, actually uh, being implemented right now, this uh, picture that you see came from the Journal Sentinel, our new local newspaper. It was just in the paper about three or four weeks ago. We have anaerobic digesters at South Shore that allow us to uh, digest the, the biosolids that we have. They produce gas, biogas. Um, our goal is to have 100% of that uh, gas captured, which is about four megawatts daily burn that in generators and produce enough power to run the South Shore facility without uh, outside uh, energy sources. Currently, we're about two megawatts. These uh, digesters have been in place since the 1960s. We're going in right now and cleaning them and putting in new uh, mixing systems. Um, so we're currently about 50% of the goal. We want to reach 60% uh, through some improved mixing and uh, cleaning of the digesters. We think that's going to save our ratepayers about $500,000 per year. And then we just completed the construction of a, um, what we call a high-strength waste handling facility, which is a, all it is is a facility where uh, trucks can come in with um, organic waste from uh, food production, from farms, and so forth. Uh, we can take that organic waste and mix it in with the uh, human waste, put it into these digesters, and produce even more um, gas. I think the headline in the local newspaper said MMSD needs more gas, which brought some laughs from folks. But that's how we're going to get to that that other two megawatts that we're looking for. We're going to go through improvements to the facilities, but also partnering with the uh, industry in the region. And with that, um, I think that's about the timeline they, I needed to speak. Here's my contact information. Again, the website is MMSD.com and um, my phone number, if you want to email or phone me, to feel, please feel free. And I don't know if I'm supposed to address these questions, but I see one question, uh, do you use sludge digestion? That question came in early on during the presentation. We do di uh, have the digesters down at South Shore, which I talked about. We also have an inner plant pipeline, so we can exchange or exchange we can share um, biosolids between the, um, the two uh, water reclamation facilities. So biosolids from Jones Island can be taken down to South Shore if we need to to digest them, or we can take uh, biosolids from South Shore up to Jones Island to produce malorganite. So that's, um, that's kind of uh, a, a very sustainable way of, of managing those biosolids as well. Kevin, there were a number of questions on funding, um, and the first one was really with regards to the uh, green or the conservation funding for the conservation easements. So we had a specific question about the source of funding for the initial land purchase. Okay. And then once you turn it over to the municipalities, how will they kind of continue to manage it? 
That's a great question. It really, uh, and it, it went to the heart of the program when we started setting it up. So the district MMSD has two budgets. One is the operation and maintenance budget, which is based on the flow and the, the quality of the water that comes into our plants. Um, so that's a user fee type uh, billing. Our capital improvement program is paid for with a property tax. So we have an equalized value that we charge all the properties in the region, um, all the except for tax exempt, of course, but all those taxable properties, we have a property tax that we charge uh, for the capital improvements. So the Green Seams Conservation Easement Program, our component of that acquisition cost comes from the capital budget, which is uh, property tax based, and we pay for, uh, for that component out of the capital budget. We've also had great partnerships with the state of Wisconsin. They have the uh, uh, stewardship program here, and so they, uh, which, which is a program where they're preserving land throughout the state of Wisconsin. So we'll partner our funding with their funding and uh, purchase these properties. We put the easement on them. Once we turn them over to either a municipality or a local land trust, we uh, require that they maintain the properties for the long term, which means managing invasives and some of these other issues. So it's um, it's a real partnership from the beginning, and it's our money plus state funding and um, the local municipalities and take over the maintenance. And they utilize it for open space uh, recreational uses. And just a little bit more on that long term maintenance, especially of the large natural engineered structure. Can you speak to anything about the training that was required for those infrastructure practices? Um, for the Green Seams program, uh, there's, there, is, there is a lot of training required. Um, I can't go into the specifics because I'm a civil engineer and I wouldn't be able to answer them uh, in an intelligent fashion. But we do have to work with those folks because you need to make sure that they understand what the invasives are, what the impact of invasives are. We also go in and if it's farmed wetlands or farmed areas that we're purchasing, we'll go in and, and try to cut the tiles and return some of that hydrology to its pre-farmed condition. On one of the sites, we just created a wetland up in the uh, suburb of Mequon that uh, is on one of the Green Seams facilities where we basically just cut the tiles off so they weren't draining these uh, uh, wetlands that were there before. And we did do some regrading to uh, help with that, and then we reseeded it. And we're actually looking to try to do more of that in the future. I think the wetland uh, component of what we do could provide both flood management uh, protection for the downstream residents. It increases the habitat for the region. It improves water quality. So on a lot of our green scenes, we're looking to try to expand those parcels into just being not just only being open land, but also being open land that uh, has its wetland hydrology returned to its pre-developed nature so that we can uh, incorporate uh, all these benefits into it. But there is a lot of training, um, a lot of uh, just, it, it's a lot of hand-on work. You're really out there on the field uh, working uh, with nature. We had some questions um, in the policy realm with regards to the watershed permit. If you could talk a little bit more about what exactly is required to get a watershed permit in that particular river basin, and what was the appeal to the communities to require that? Sure. So on the Menominee River, I don't know the exact number, I think it was 18 or so different individual permits drained into that watershed. And like everywhere else in the country, each one of those permits had its own requirements that that municipality had to implement. So. Um, we started saying we'd re we just completed this water quality plan that said we need to work as a watershed, yet each of the individual communities were permitted uh, separately. So what we said we need to do is we need to try to um, bring all that together. And it really took a strong leader. In, in our case, it was uh, Tom Grisa from uh, the city of Brookfield stepped forward and said, you know, I think this is something that would benefit my community because what the watershed permit is, is it's really an umbrella permit that sits over the top of all these individual permits. But each individual permit refers back to the umbrella permit. And within that umbrella permit, 
It allows the municipalities to work on uh, watershed projects or group projects that may have two or three municipalities putting in funding for a larger project that has more benefits to the watershed itself. And the, the benefits that the municipalities saw to that is, in most cases, and we're, they're, still, they're developing those projects right now, we feel that they could put in a lower dollar amount but get a larger improvement in the watershed itself, a bigger bang for the buck. So each municipality can pool their dollars, leverage their dollars with their, their neighbors, have one single project that has more benefit to the watershed, yet they have to pay less. And with the tight resources we have, again, partnerships, working with neighbors, thinking about things outside the norm is, is really some of the innovation that we need to move forward with to, um, to address climate change. We're going to go back to kind of how you got started with more of the sustainable approach. Um, who and how was your 2005, uh, if you could talk a little about compiling that carbon footprint? Sure. Who was involved and how was it done? Um, well, I actually went to a conference in Oregon, and I was at this conference, and they were talking about developing baseline carbon footprints for the water facilities out there. And I came back, and I talked to my great staff, and I said, you know, no matter what we do, we're going to have to know where we're at. We're going to have to know that starting point. So we uh, we went out with a uh, RFP. We hired a consultant. They came in. They did the – and this is the nitty-gritty work. They went down in, and they looked at – you know, where we were using energy, how we were using energy, how much um, was the emissions from that, and developed the, the baseline through all the facilities to tell us where we needed to uh, reduce, or where we were, and then we knew where we could needed to reduce. And that not only helped us with our carbon footprint, but it helped us to um, see inefficiencies in the system, so we were able to pool our thoughts and, and bring uh, some of those... Uh, innovative thinking approaches together, and uh, it took a while. It took probably 18 months or so, two years, to get that baseline done, but well worth the time and the money. A few questions about sort of uh, gaining collaboration or get helping engage people. We had a specific question about if what's it like trying to get private ho homeowners to participate or uh, give put their land in easement to increase the buffers? Um, so there's there's a couple of uh, answers there. If we're talking about the uh, conservation easement program where we're purchasing the buffers, it's all a voluntary purchase, and a lot of it is farmland that we're we're purchasing. Uh, and you know when you start talking to farmers, you start talking about um, the future of their land. A lot of them grew up on that land. A lot of their 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 parents grew up on that land. So they they're invested in the property. And some of the ones that we've talked to, um, if you go to MMSD.com, on the right side there's some videos. Look up the Green Seams video and play that. There's a lot of them they have seen that, you know, their kids are moving. They're not, they're not going into the farm world. So they're concerned about what's going to happen to this land that's been in their families forever. And so they are really looking for someone to manage that land. And we still have some of that land that's farmed but manage that land either as, as farmland but also to protect it uh, from being paved over and developed. And so some of the land is, is, is really just through that, uh, that ethic that these great farmers have for the land that they grew up on. On the, the second part of that question is if you went to the individual homeowners for the rain barrels, the rain gardens, looking at some of these approaches on their private lots, it just comes down to educating them and Unfortunately, sometimes it takes a catastrophe. The July 2010 storm uh, really opened people's eyes to the problems water can pose for their basements with basement flooding um, for uh, their downstream neighbors. So you try to just talk to them about, you know, you can do a really simple thing that improves the aesthetics of your property, but it also helps, helps that downstream neighbor to prevent water in their basements. So it's a lot of it's a lot of public education. Kind of get into a more uh, technical question. When you process the biosolids to convert them to the fertilizer product, uh, what's what kind of testing do you do for either heavy metal 
metals, pharmaceuticals, things like that. We've got our own lab uh, here at the district that takes samples daily. It's a great question because um, uh, back in the, uh, I think it was 1980s or so, there was a, a concern about um, biosolids and the impacts, the health impacts on humans. So we, uh, we have an industrial waste pretreatment program here at the district, so we try to remove as much of the heavy metals as we can at the source prior to getting into the system. But uh, once they get to malorganite where it's um, heat dried, uh, that kills the pathogens. But then the pharmaceuticals, the, uh, some of the other things that you we're looking at are all tested on a daily basis, PCBs. We had a problem in 2009 where one of the municipalities was cleaning a sewer. It had this gummy substance on the bottom of the pipe. And as they were cleaning it, that washed downstream. Well, that gummy substance turned out to be very uh, high uh, PCB uh, content. And uh, we ended up having to uh, landfill quite a bit of our malorganite because by the time we found out about it, it had gotten into the, uh, the product. So we quarantined all that, got rid of it. We safely disposed of it. But you have to be up, up on these. You have to be on a daily basis. You have to get your numbers back. You can't wait for a lab result five days later. And you have to really uh, just uh, manage that stock so that you don't ship anything until you know that it's uh, met all the standards that you have. And, and we have a very high standard for malorganite. I think people are really interested to know more about your 2035 vision and specifically how uh, climate change data or predictions influenced your planning process and how you finally settled on your climate mitigation and adaptation goals. Um, well, science, the science of climate change is something that we are relying on a great deal. But as you know, if you've looked at any of this, the ranges between what could be uh, can you know vary significantly. Um, so that's why we worked with SewerPAC and the uh, university to drill that information down to our local level. But the science is really what we're using to implement the climate change initiatives that we have on plate on 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 the table right now. The vision itself, um, you know, actually just came from from me and from some of my staff. You know, we had these huge storms hit in 08, 09, 2010, and it was just one of those things where I said, you know, something's happening here. And we may not be wanting to say what's causing this to happen, but in the world of, of wastewater, water, stormwater management, we need to be able to handle these extreme events. And so I just said, you know, we need to plan for that. We need to be prepared for it, and we need to set a goal for what we want to do in the future to minimize our impact. So that's why we're doing this vulnerability analysis. That's why we're really uh, doing a lot of the initiatives that are in the greener world. We're still doing a lot of the gray stuff as well. But, um, you know, I, it sounds self-serving, but it, it comes from people saying, this is the right thing to do. Don't be afraid to lead. Get out there and do it. On that line, um, someone brought up the fact that, that sometimes that uh, – is there anything that sort of helped you do that? In other words, have you been able to benefit from anything in the federal TMDL or other requirements that might give you credit, so to speak, for some of these programs? Well, the first thing that came to mind when you started that question was great staff. Okay, I have great, great, great staff, and they're, they're doing a lot. Uh, one thing that we, um, we actually worked with the EPA on, who, again, phenomenal partner for us, along with the Department of Natural Resources. We have a, a, a permit for the wastewater plants to discharge water. And so along about the same line when we were working on this watershed permit, we went to the EPA and the DNR and we said, we're doing a lot of green infrastructure. We're building a lot of rain barrels, rain gardens, porous pavement, green roofs, all these different things. And we're not getting credit for it. So uh, working with um, Region 5, Bob Newport, and others, we were able to, and, and Russ Rasmussen at DNR, we were able to put into our uh, permit a requirement that we build green infrastructure. 
So within our five-year permit, we're required to build at least a million gallons of green infrastructure equivalent uh, storage uh, each year. So it's fi up to five million gallons over the five-year term. So here was a, a, another instance where we said this is the right thing to do. This is something that we're doing already. We need to see if we can help the regulators help us to um, uh, implement it in a more uh, uh, stringent or straightforward fashion with the, with the permit. And so it's the first wastewater permit in the country to require green infrastructure. I'm very proud of that. And I think the DNR and EPA should be as well. They've really, um, you know, they've really stepped forward, and now it's a model that can be used other places in the country. Some people were also interested in hearing about how you interacted with some of the other um, municipal service providers like your drinking water treatment facility or any other collaborations that have helped you along the way. Yeah, I think the um, it, it's it's beyond just the utilities or the municipalities. So each of my 28 municipalities have stormwater authority. Stormwater becomes flood water or it becomes combined sewage or it becomes infiltration and inflow into the separate system. So going to the municipalities, originally I just said, you know, we're all in this together. The hydrologic cycle is what it is, and that water is going to end up somewhere, and a lot of times it's in the regional or, or local sewer systems. How can we work together together in a cost-effective manner to manage that better? So it's really, um, it really has been just working with those engineers, those directors of public works in the, in the different municipalities, and, and that's helped us move that along. But it's also working with the environmental community. A lot of times we feel that um, we're cross purposes with environmental groups, but you know we all want the same thing. We want clean drinking water. We want clean water and, and, and habitat for recreation. So really, start talking to the environmental community as well. There's a great organization here in the region called the Southeast Wisconsin Watersheds Trust, which is a group of environmental groups working together on common purposes for um, green infrastructure, climate change, other issues. Um. What about any legal barriers or other challenges that came up in implementing some of this? Someone asked specifically about the green seams program. Well, there's no legal barriers to green seams because it's just a voluntary purchase. So it's just like anyone else going out and purchasing land. Um, we had to be able to justify that purchase under our jurisdiction, and because we're a flood management entity as well, any land purchased upstream that is not turned into concrete is going to uh, help us reduce future flooding. So that was an easy connection. No, no real uh, legal issues there. When it came to dealing with the individual property owners for private property work, we also have an, a private property inflow and infiltration program, which is critical to this whole thing because we're trying to keep that clear water out of the sanitary system so that we're not treating all that water and we're not putting carbon emissions into the atmosphere treating that clean water, cleaner water, I should say. Um, so. In dealing with the private property, um, we really are working through our municipalities to do that work. So, you know, there's a lot of legal hurdles out there. A lot of that comes from regulation. If you sometimes can step back from what the, uh, the dotted I's and the cross T's say and think about what it's trying to say or trying to do, you can you can work with your regulators and the legal uh, uh, world to um, make these things work. Um, going back to the infrastructure, why? what was the need to dig down 300 feet for the tunnels originally, and then how was that the gray infrastructure paid for? I think you've talked some about the green, but I was we were wondering about the gray as well. Sure. Well, the gray is paid for the same way. It's out of the capital budget, which is the equalized value. Um, approximately, and, and so we started that in the uh, the 80s. 1980s. At that time, there was this great thing called construction grant program. We received quite a few grants from the federal government, along with you know just like everyone else did. And so I think it's like 55% of the deep tunnel was paid for with uh, federal grants. There's not grants out there anymore, um, and a lot of communities I feel sorry for because 
they're having to address combined sewer overflows or separate sewer overflows without that grant program. And I really think sustainable funding is something we need along with uh, uh, sustainable approaches. Um, the reason we went 300 feet down for the deep tunnel is we wanted to get in a good a, get, to get into a good rock formation, and in the Milwaukee region, uh, good limestone was about uh, 300 feet down. So it's all built with a tunnel boring machine, and um, it's just a, a stronger, uh, a more durable, sustainable uh, uh, material for us to build the tunnels in. And just one other question on funding: How much again do the or the uh, citizens pay for the rain barrels, and how did you set that rate for the rain barrels? Yeah. Um, the rain barrels started out, I think they were about $25 each. Um, I had purchased a couple of them online from national vendors, and I was paying 100 to $120. And what I said to the folks here was, we need to make this affordable for the lower-income residents of the Milwaukee region. So with the rain barrel program, we partnered with a inner-city youth group. They We give them the barrels, and uh, we uh, buy the uh, the hardware that's needed to convert them, and this inner city youth group converts the barrels. So we were paying, we were charging about twenty five dollars over the years. It's gone up to about fifty, and that's because we refined the design so that it's, uh, they're more um, durable. That the rain barrels themselves are more durable. So we're paying for for the labor, we're paying for the parts and for the barrels. We used to be able to get barrels for free because everyone was just throwing them away, but We've created such a market for them now. We're paying about, I think, two or three dollars a barrel, just for the raw barrel. So we're um, uh, working with an inner city youth group. We're paying them to do the work. They're getting job training on this as as uh, they move through the process. And the fifty dollars is just the break-even number. We don't make a profit on our rain barrels. And then just two final questions. One on working. Um, especially someone mentioned rural communities tend to be more conservative with regards to climate change. How did you get specific buy-in related you know, a lot to of some it's of the you, initiative? I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Andy. Oh, go ahead. Um, a, lot of, a lot of it is how you talk about it. So, you know, you can go out and talk about climate change, and that will turn a lot of people off, and it still does here in the Milwaukee area. Um, but when you start talking about, okay, remember that storm in July 2010 where we had the sinkhole and we had, you know, damage to the infrastructure, do we want that to happen again or do we want to plan our facilities to try to at least minimize that damage? That's where you start talking about vulnerability analysis. We need to make sure that our infrastructure is not vulnerable to these storms that might or might not be occurring more frequently and heavier. So a lot of it is just how you talk about it. And you also need to find champions. You need to find people that will go out there and, and say, you know, we need to make sure that the infrastructure we're, we're building today um, is the most sustainable approach uh, moving forward. Excellent. And then just a final question. Um, one of the participants felt it w they would really benefit in learning more about how you guys proceeded with this initiative. Um, is there any, do you provide that information or share that information so other regional sewer districts could learn more about that? Oh, sure. I, you know, um, we're talking at all, well, we're doing a lot of webinars right now, but we're, we're, we're speaking to different groups around the country. Um, one of my staff is heading to New Orleans next week, uh, so we'll come and speak if you need us. Um, uh, I'm a member of NACWA, National Association of Clean Water Agencies. A lot of this is disseminated there. And then there's a great organization called the U.S. Water Alliance, which is really, um, I think, focusing more on the inner reaction between stormwater, wastewater, drinking water, uh, this whole one water concept. So uh, the, they have a conference in um, September in Los Angeles. We'll be speaking at that as well. So it's it's through conferences. It's through uh, presentations, webinars, and you know, just trying to get the word out. But we'll, I, we'll, help, really, we'll help anyone we can. Kevin, I really want to thank you for your willingness to talk to today. This was an excellent discussion, um, so thank you all for the participants, for the questions. Also, I want to thank the Great Lakes Regional Water Program, the National Sea Grant College Program, and the Ohio State University for funding this webinar. 
I did want to quickly remind you that our survey URL for this webinar is in the chat feature. Please take a few minutes to fill that out. We would like to, your input as we develop a regional climate site. Um, I also would like to refer you to other resources and an archive of all the previous webinar presentations which are located at changingclimate.osu.edu. This webinar series is sponsored by the OSU Climate Change Outreach Team and will continue on Thursday, July 11th with an overview of the new Great Lakes Climate Change Curriculum with Ohio Sea Grants Education Coordinator Lindsay Manzo. Registration is up in the chat feature, so feel free to register now for July's webinar. Thank you again to Kevin and all our participants. We hope this was beneficial and that you'll join us again in an upcoming webinar. Thanks, everybody, and have a great afternoon.